Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to Reading Through the Bible, Elder Linda. So glad you joined me. Well, we have a really good lesson today. Of course, we always have a good lesson. Uh, but if it's your first time joining, uh, we will be reading through the Bible together. Uh, make sure we understand what we're reading. And we're going to make application to our lives. And of course, I post a new video uh, every Wednesday. So give me a thumb up or subscribe to the channel. If you, if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, you'll be notified whenever there's a new video posted. And of course, like always, comments and questions are always welcome. But last week we were on Matthew chapter 27. Well, we've been on Matthew chapter 27 for the past two weeks. And so last week we uh, read chat verses 27 through 56, which talked about uh, how they mocked Jesus. And we talked about Jesus' crucifixion and we talked about his death. So this week we will be in um, reading from verse 57 through 66, which is through the end of the chapter. So we'll be finishing chapter 27 this week, uh, where we'll talk about Jesus' burial and how they posted guards uh, at his tomb to make sure no one stole his body. So we're gonna talk about that. So let's just jump right in because we have a lot of material to cover. Um, also, time permits, I want to do a recap uh, at the end, just uh, a recap of the final week. Just just go over it, the final week so we can kind of put all the pieces together because sometimes you, know, you feel like things are fragmented and we want to just um, put that final week of Jesus' life uh, together just to run over it. So, amen. Let's just start with a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Father, we just praise you. We adore you. We magnify you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for just being our God, being our Lord, being our Savior. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We, we can't thank you enough. Lord, we appreciate you. I just pray for all those that will be listening to this broadcast, all those that will uh, come in on the study, Lord God. Father, that you would cause your word to be made real to each person. Father, that you would give them a fresh anointing, Give me a fresh anointing, Lord God. Father, that we might understand your word even far greater than we ever have. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to read your word and to study your scriptures. And we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so we're going to jump right in there. <clears throat> we're going to go to, um, we're on chapter 27 of Matthew. We're reading from the New Living Translation, and we're going to start in verse 57. Verse 57 says, as evening approach, Joseph, now where we are now, Jesus has, Jesus has died on the cross, and uh, we've already went through, went through where, let's just go this back so we'll make sure we know where we're at. Um, Jesus has died on the cross, and I, I don't think I mentioned this last week. But after he died, uh, remember, the Sabbath is from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. So Jesus died at 3 p.m. He was crucified at 9 a.m. in the morning. He was on the cross for at least six hours. He died at 3 p.m. So somewhere between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. they had to take him off the cross because they wanted they didn't want any of the um uh those any of those three that were crucified to still be on the cross when sabbath day started which usually would be about 6 p.m when the sun goes down so they had um the jews had gone and asked uh asked the governor well look can we can we uh can we break their legs so we can hasten their death because it's something about breaking their legs because when you, when you still have your legs and you're on the cross you can keep pushing yourself up and it prolongs your death because you're still catching your breath but if you break their legs and they can't push themselves up and they can't uh keep trying to to uh increase their their lung capacity so they can breathe so um they asked Pilate if they could break their legs and Pilate said yes because uh so that they can get them down off the cross because the Sabbath day is getting ready to start and they didn't want them on the cross on the Sabbath day. So the they went in, in John 19, you'll find this in John 19, verse 31 to 33, where they broke the legs of the two thieves, the ones that were 
crucified with Jesus. And when it came time for them to break Jesus' legs, they found out he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. Instead, the uh, the guard took his, uh, his uh, sword and pierced him in the side. And blood and water came out of his side because Jesus was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. And actually, that was a fulfillment of scripture because in Exodus chapter 12, verse 46, uh, it talks about the lamb that was slain, that's supposed to be slain for the Passover. And the Passover lamb in Exodus could not have any broken bones. And also in Psalms 34, verse 20, it tells us that uh, none of Jesus' bones was going to be broken. So this is a fulfillment of prophecy that none of his bones were to be broken. And instead of breaking his bones, as I said, they pierced him in the side and blood and water came out. And you'll find that in John chapter 19, verse 34. So anyway, that's what happened. So, so somewhere between 3 p.m. and 6, Jesus gets taken off the cross. And remember, we stress the fact that he did not hang on the cross all night long because that would have taken him into the Sabbath day. So they took him down somewhere between 3 p.m. when he died and 6 p.m. he was taken down off the cross. So here we're reading in um, verse 57, it says, And as evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea, who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Jesus took the body, I mean, I'm sorry, Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. Now, both Mary, verse 61, both Mary Magdalene, these are the faithful women that were always by Jesus' side, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb and were watching. So they're being very attentive and they're watching because they have plans on uh, uh, giving Jesus a proper burial because they, they use spices and other things that they use for the burial. And um, so they, they want to come back and do that. So they're trying to, you know, just watch and see where they're going to where they're going to bury him so we can come back later and do what we have to do. Uh, <clears throat> now, let's just look at some of my notes I have on just that section. Well, talking about this Joseph, who was a rich man. Joseph was a member of the council. That's the council of the Sanhedrin. Uh, and you find that in Mark chapter 15, verse 43. And he actually believed in Jesus. But how many people know uh, he probably was a little scared, be, you know, to speak up a lot. Uh, but he was bold enough to go and ask for Jesus' body. So I guess at this point, Joseph has gotten over his fear of what people are going to say about him uh, being a supporter of Jesus. And it said he laid Jesus in a new tomb. Now, in Luke chapter 25, 51, it tells that Joseph had not agreed with the decision or the actions of the council. So he was not in agreement, in agreement with them to put Jesus to death. Because again, he was, a, he was a silent believer. And Joseph being a rich man, that was all according to a fulfillment of prophecy. And we're going to find that out in uh, Isaiah chapter 53, which we're going to read that in just a minute. But in Isaiah chapter 53, it, it said that Jesus was going to be buried in a rich man's grave. And Isaiah, the book of Isaiah was written over 700, over 700 years before Jesus was ever even born. It was prophesied that he was going to be put in a rich man's tomb. So, yeah, and just remember that the Sabbath, uh, just got to note down here, the Sabbath consists of, was officially Sunset Friday to Sunset Saturday, according to the NIV Study Bible for Matthew chapter 27, verse 62. Okay, so um, let's read in Isaiah chapter 53. In Isaiah chapter 53, it says, who was believed, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing 
beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. And this is talking about Jesus. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with the deepest grief. And why did he have all that grief? Because of our sins. We turned our backs on him and we looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. It was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. By his stripes we're healed. He was whipped so we could be healed. Verse 6, I'm in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord had laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep is silent before the shearers. He did not open his mouth unjust and un, uh, he did not open his mouth. He was unjustly condemned. He was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, because Jesus was 33 when he died. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. And he had done no wrong and had never received, never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal and he was put in a rich man's grave. And that's the part I want you to, um, to hear that he was put in a rich man's grave. And that's in Isaiah, 700, over 700 years before Jesus was born, that was prophesied. Okay, we're back in Matthew chapter 27, verse 62. Said so the next day, so this is after, um, you know, they, they put him in the tomb. It was close to the Sabbath, so they had to leave him there. And it was kind of too late for the, for the women to go back and properly do a burial. So they were going to come back the next day. So the next day on the Sabbath, uh, the leading priest, well, they weren't, gonna, I'm sorry, they weren't going to come back the next day. They were going to come back, um, Sunday morning, because the Sabbath, you can't do any work on the Sabbath. So they're going to come back Sunday morning. But so the next day on the Sabbath, verse 62, the leading priests and the Pharisees went to see Pilate. And they told him, sir, we remember what that deceiver once said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. And this will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone that he was raised from the dead. Because if this happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. Pilate replied, take guards and secure it the best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. So what do we have here? We have here the, the chief priest going to uh, Pilate and the Pharisees and saying, you know what? Uh, he said he was going to be resurrected. So, so, so we can make sure his disciples don't steal his body and then they'll tell everybody that he's resurrected and then we're still going to look bad. So they said, we want this, this tomb sealed. We want it guarded. And Pilate gave him permission. He said, okay, seal it, guard it, secure it the best way you can. So actually what they were doing here, they thought they were securing so people, someone couldn't steal their body. They were actually going to confirm the fact that it was impossible for anybody to steal his body because it's surrounded by guards. They had some kind of seal on there so you can tell if the stone is rolled away. So the disciples could not have come and stolen the body. But this is a, a going to be a story we're going to find out in John, a story that they're going to tell people throughout the ages that some that the disciples came and stole his body away. It was impossible. We're going to find out that they paid the guards. Um, well, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but they but they did not steal. Um, they did not steal the body away. Okay, so. Right quickly, we have a few more minutes. I just want to go over what has happened thus far, just over the uh, Holy Week, the Passion Week. Passion Week was from Sunday, the triumphal entry day that he entered into Jerusalem through Sunday, his resurrection day. So the triumphal entry, we're just going to just go through it so we can put the pieces together uh, for this last week. So Sunday was a triumphal entry when Jesus rode in on a donkey into Jerusalem. 
And you find that in Matthew chapter 21, verse 1 through 11. Then on Monday, Monday, Jesus cleansed the temple of the money changers. He, uh, these people were selling, uh, selling animals and for outrageous amounts, and they were uh, exchanging people's money and getting interest on it. So they were getting rich off of people. Jesus was upset about that and, and, and kicked them out. That's what he did on Monday. On Tuesday, and I'm just giving you some of the highlights from those days. On Tuesday, uh, Jesus was anointed at Bethany by Mary. Mary, the sister, Mary, uh, who was Martha's sister, and Martha and Lazarus' sister. And this was for preparation for his death. You find that in Matthew chapter 26, verse 7 through 13. Then on Wednesday, there was a plot to kill Jesus by the high priest and the Jewish elders. So Wednesday, they're plotting to kill him. They want to see how they can get rid of him. Uh, Thursday, Thursday, Jesus had the Last Supper, which uh, turned into the Lord's Supper, where he instituted communion. Uh, so it was like the Passover meal. He was eating the Passover meal with his disciples, uh, as they normally do. But it turned from the Passover meal... He instituted a the Lord's Supper with saying, this is my body that was broken for you. Uh, then when they drank the wine, this is my blood that was shed for you. Uh, this do in remembrance of me. So now the uh, the last supper, or the Lord's Supper, it, it took on a whole new meaning than what it had initially. It was no longer about uh, the exodus and the children of Israel when they rushed out of Egypt and all of that. You know, now it's it's about Jesus dying for us. So on Thursday, uh, after, the, after the Lord's Supper, they uh, went to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed and agonized in the garden and where he sweat great drops, uh, where he sweat as if it was great drops of blood. So he was agonizing. He was in extreme anguish. You find that in Luke chapter 22, 44 and Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 through 46. So after they leave the garden, they're leaving out of the garden. Jesus uh, is met by the guards. Judas kisses him to betray him because he had told them the, the person I kiss is the one that is Jesus of Nazareth. So he kissed, he kissed Jesus. The guards arrest him. While they're trying to arrest him, of course, we have the time when Peter uh, cut off the ear of one of the guards because he wanted to uh, protect Jesus. And remember, Jesus rebuked Peter and told him, no, we're not going to do that because Jesus was willingly going to the cross. And he told Peter and the rest of them, he said, don't you know I could call 12 legions of angels, which is 72,000 angels. That's a lot of angels. He said, I could call these, those minor angels and, and they will protect me. But he was willingly going to the cross. And you find that in John chapter 18, verse 10, and Matthew 26, verse 47 through 56. And we got that because one legion of soldiers is 6,000 soldiers. Just you see where the numbers came from. So 12 legions would equal 72,000. So that's how we got the 72,000 angels that he could call. So then after they arrested him, Jesus' first two trials were illegal trials. They took him before Annas, who was uh, the previous high priest. And uh, he's no longer the acting high priest, but he still has that title. But they took him to Annas. Um, when, you know, when he's for Annas, then Annas took, took him to, uh, he went before Caiaphas after Annas, he went before Caiaphas, which were two illegal hearings because they were conducted during the night hours, Thursday night. And they were supposed to, uh, the Sanhedrin is not supposed to have hearings during the night. So they were illegal hearings that they were having. They were had it at the priest's home. And that you find in John chapter 18, verse 12 through 14 and verse 19 through 24. And then Friday came along. So when Friday came along, they, the Sanhedrin had the legal trial that Friday morning, he met before the entire Sanhedrin. So this is the third trial he's having. He had one before Annas, one for Caiaphas. Now this is the third one is before the entire Sanhedrin on Friday. And this one was a legal hearing where, uh, they, uh, asked him if he was the son of God, if he was the Messiah, and he said that he was. And of course, the chief priest ripped his clothes off and said, we don't need to hear anything else. We need to just, he needs to be crucified. So they couldn't crucify him because the Jews does not have the authority to do capital punishment. So they had to take Jesus to the governor who was Pontius Pilate. So when he appeared before Pontius Pilate for his first hearing, 
That's in Matthew chapter 27, verse 2, uh, and verse 11 through 14, and also Mark chapter 15, verse 1 through 5. So Jesus is then sent to appear before Herod. And how he got before Herod, because while Pilate was asking him questions, Pilate found out that Jesus used to live in Galilee, and Herod was over the Galilee area. So he said, oh, okay, well, Pilate sent him to Herod. So now he went before Annas, he went before Caiaphas, the high priest. Then he went before the entire Sanhedrin, that's the third hearing. Then he went before Pontius Pilate, that's his fourth hearing. And now Pilate is sending him to Herod because Herod is from the Galilee area. Uh, so then Jesus' final trial, because Herod actually wanted Jesus to do some miracles for him. And when Jesus didn't do anything, he, you know, he sent Jesus back to Pilate. So Pilate was the sixth and the final hearing that he had before Pilate. Pilate did not find anything wrong with him. In fact, neither did Herod. And incidentally, Pilate and Herod were enemies up until this, uh, up until Jesus' hearings. And once uh, this incident happened with Jesus, they became best of friends. But um, Pilate, Pilate's wife actually told him that he should not have anything to do uh, with Jesus because she had had a dream. And in the dream... Uh, it wasn't good. She said, you better leave that, that uh, innocent man alone. Well, Pilate was afraid of the people, so he, he ended up uh, beating Jesus. He flogged him, and then he turned him over or scourged him and turned him over to the people. And you find that in John 19, verse 1. And incidentally, uh, just a bit of information for us, the Bible does not give us any details about how many lashes Jesus received. I know we saw the Passion of Christ, which could have been just, you know, how they beat him. But it doesn't tell us how many lashes he received. Um, the Jews had a law that you could not beat anybody more than 40 lashes. So they would stop at 39 to make sure they didn't go past 40. But that was the Jews. Jesus was beat by the Romans. The Romans were in charge. The Jews were underneath the Romans. So the, it, it's probably not likely that the Romans were going to follow the Jewish laws or traditions because they didn't have to, you know, they, they were the boss, they were in control and a Roman beating, it was pretty brutal. And so, uh, we don't know how he was beat, but I know Romans used, they used whips with, uh, metal tips on the end. Uh, and a beating for the Romans was part of the crucifixion. You had to get beat first and then they took you to be crucified. And it, you know, just putting two, two, two and two together, it makes you think that he was beat pretty bad because he couldn't carry the cross by himself. He had to have help carrying the cross. They, uh, they got this Simon of Cyrene to help him, the African man, to help him to carry the cross. Okay, so this is on... We're still on Friday. So according to uh, manners and customs, when they went to mock Jesus, because they went to, after, after Pilate turned him over to the guards to go be crucified, the soldiers uh, got together and decided they were going to have some fun with Jesus. And it said the entire regiment, the entire regiment, uh, according to manners and customs, could be 300 to 1,000 soldiers so that they can mock him. And, and, and I guess the point was to humiliate him. Uh, so they put a crown of thorns on his head. They spit on him. They stripped him. Uh, they gave him a scepter. They uh, put a, a robe on him, mocking him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Uh, they blindfolded him so that they could hit him. And then after they hit him, they said, Prophesy who hit you. We talked about all that. Uh, and when they were finished mocking him, then they, they put his, took the robe off, put his clothes back on, and led him to be crucified. Then he was crucified. At 9 a.m. in the morning, and we talked about that. And uh, last week, we talked about all the things that were said on the cross. Uh, he was crucified at 9 a.m., and he died at 3 p.m. So from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, uh, what happened during that, that span of time, from 9 a.m. to 12, that's in the three hour, first three hours, he was nailed to the cross at 9 a.m. His first sayings were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You find that in Luke chapter 23, verse 34. You have the soldiers gambling for his clothing uh, at the foot of the cross. You find that in Mark 15, 24. Then you have people that were shouting 
uh, different things to him. If you're the son of God, come down off the cross. You know, they're jeering him. Uh, the chief priest said he saved others. He can't save himself. Then the soldiers were shouting at him. If you are the king of the Jews, then save yourself. Then we had the conversation where he had with one of the criminals. They said, if you're the Christ, then save yourself and save us too. And then the other criminal that rebuked him. And Jesus saying to the other criminal after he rebuked him, because the other criminal says he believed in Jesus. And he turned around and he says, uh, remember me when you come into your kingdom, which showed that he believed in Jesus. And uh, Jesus said to him, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. So that, that particular criminal received his salvation right there on the cross. Uh, then his third saying, he said to John, who was at the bottom of the cross, and he said, woman, behold thy son, telling his mother to behold John, and behold thy mother. And from that day forward, John took care of Jesus' mother. And that, you can find that in John chapter 19, verse 26 to 27. And then there was darkness from the six o'clock, from the sixth hour, which was 12 noon, to the ninth hour, which would be 3 p.m. You find that in Mark 15, 33. So between 12 noon and 3 p.m., after it was dark, it was dark for three hours straight, the first thing that Jesus said during that darkness was, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he wouldn't have said that if he didn't feel forsaken, if he didn't feel uh, like God has turned his face on him. Because remember, he's becoming sin for us. So G uh, God had to turn his face from him temporarily because God is not going to leave him in hell. But for this, this moment, he had to allow Jesus to become sin for us. Jesus became a curse for us. Remember, we talked about curses, everyone to hang on the tree. He became a curse for us. So he said, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? That was his fourth saying. His fifth saying was, I thirst. The sixth saying he said was, it is finished. And then the seventh and the final saying he said is, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. You find that in Luke chapter 23, verse 46. And to commend in the Greek means in, in, into your hands I trust my spirit. Into your hands, Father, I commit my spirit for, for you to protect it and keep me safe. And that's exactly what God did. So in Psalm 1610, it says, For it says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer, thy suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So yes, God was not going to um, leave his soul in hell. Uh, so very quickly, there's some of the things that happened after Jesus died. There was an earthquake. The veil was rent from top to the bottom. This is when he gave up the ghost when he finally died. There was an earthquake. The veil was rent from top to bottom, which made the way for us to have access to the Holy of Holies. Graves were open. Uh, and some of the saints were resurrected. The soldiers finally saw the light and they started um, saying truly this was the son of God. The crowd became convicted because they saw the darkness and the earthquake. Uh, we talked about how they had uh, pierced Jesus in the side. They did not break his legs, which is according to the prophecy. And we talked about how Joseph of Arimathea requested Jesus' body and he buried him in a new tomb. And how the tomb was sealed and how the guards were posted to make sure his body was not stolen. Amen. So just want to run through that so you can get the whole picture of that last week of uh, Passion Week of Jesus' life here on this earth. And next week, we're going to be on the last chapter, Matthew chapter 28. Amen. So let's just say a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord God. Jesus, we appreciate all that you've done for us. We thank you that you died and you rose again just for us. Lord, we can't thank you enough. We appreciate you. We ask that you help us, oh God. Help us to live lives, Lord God, that show that we appreciate you. We give you all the glory and we give you all the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and I will see you next week.